Book of Genesis. The Masoretic Text in its Present State. Chapter 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And Elohim said, Let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And it was so. And Elohim made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament. And Elohim saw the firmament, that it was good. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And Elohim said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let the earth put forth grass, herb yielding seed, and fruit tree bearing fruit after its kind, wherein is the seed thereof upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, herb yielding seed after its kind, and tree bearing fruit, wherein is the seed thereof after its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. And Elohim said, Let the waters swarm with a living pullulation, and let fowl fly above the earth towards the face of the firmament of heaven. And it was so. And Elohim created the great sea monsters, and all the living and creeping things with which the waters swarm, after their kinds, and every winged fowl after its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And Elohim made the beast of the earth after its kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the ground after its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over every beast of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim created he him. Male and female created he them. And Elohim blessed them, and Elohim said unto them, 
be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is the breath of life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And Elohim saw everything that he had made. And, behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day Elohim finished his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day, and hallowed it, because that in it he rested from all his work, which Elohim had created and made. These are the genealogies of the heaven and of the earth when they were created. When Satan saw Adam seated on a great throne with a crown of glory on his head and a scepter in his hand, and all the angels worshipping him, he was filled with anger. And when God said to him, Come, thou also, for thou shalt worship my image and likeness, Satan refused to do so. And, assuming an arrogant and insolent manner, he said, it is meet that he should worship me, for I existed before he came into being. When the father saw his overbearing attitude, he knew that Satan's wickedness and rebellion had reached their highest pitch. He ordered the celestial soldiers to take from him the written authority that was in his hand, to strip off his armor, and to hurl him down from heaven to earth. Satan was the greatest of the angels, and God had made him the commander-in-chief of the celestial hosts. And in the document which Satan held in his hand were written the names of all the angels under his command. Knowing their names, his authority over them was absolute. When God saw that the angels hesitated to take the document from him, he commanded them to bring a sharp reaping knife and to stab him on this side and that, right through his body to the backbone and shoulder blades. And Satan could no longer stand upright. And a cherub smote him and broke his wings and his ribs. And having rendered him helpless, he cast Satan down from heaven upon the earth. Then he became the archdevil and the leader of those who were cast out of heaven with him, and who henceforth were devils. In the day that Yahweh Elohim made earth and heaven, no bush of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up. For Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. And Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And Yahweh Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made Yahweh Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. The name of the first is Pishon. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is the Badolala and the Shoham stone. And the name of the second river is Kihon, the same is it that encompasseth the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Hydekel, that is it which goeth in front of Ashir. And the fourth river is the Frath, or Euphrates. And Yahweh Elohim took the man, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help answering to him. And out of the ground Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto the man to see what he would call them. And whatsoever the man called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And the man gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for man there was not found and help meet for him. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yahweh Elohim had taken from the man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For Elohim doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves girdles. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim in the breeze of the evening. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim amongst the trees of the garden. And Yahweh Elohim called unto the man, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Cursed art thou from among all cattle, and from among every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Upon thy breast and belly. He shall keep watch against thy head, and thou shalt keep his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto the man he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In toil shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. 
In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And the man called his wife's name Hava, because she was the mother of all living. And Yahweh Elohim made for the man and for his wife tunics of skins, and clothed them. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live for ever. Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubim, in the flame of a sword which turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life. And the man knew Hava his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh. And again she bare his brother Habel, and Habel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahweh. And Habel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And Yahweh had respect unto Habel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And Yahweh said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall it not be lifted up? And if thou doest not well, sin coucheth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain said unto Abel his brother, Let us go out into the plain. And it came to pass, when they were in the plain, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And Yahweh said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now cursed art thou from the ground, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a wanderer shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto Yahweh, Mine iniquity is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the ground, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth, and it shall come to pass that whosoever findeth me shall slay me. And Yahweh said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh appointed a sign for Cain, lest any finding him should smite him. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh, and dwelt in the land of Nod, exile, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Hanak. And he builded a city, and called the name of the city, after the name of his son, Hanak. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and beget a son in his own likeness, after his own image and called his name Seth. Genesis 5.3 Information in Book 2, Adam and Eve, explains that Seth was conceived, then born seven years after the death of Abel. Adam also named Seth, that means God has heard my prayer, his sadness over Abel's death, and has delivered me out of my affliction. But it also means power and strength. Following the deaths of Adam and Eve, Seth became the head of the house of Adam. He and his descendants continued to live on God's holy mountain and continued on in the priesthood. After Seth died, the headship was then passed on to Enos, then to Kenan, to Mahalil, to Jared, to Enoch, to Methuselah, to Lamech, and then to Noah, who begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. After the birth of Seth and Achleus' son Enos, then men began to invoke the Lord by name. Genesis 4.26 
and thus began the establishment of deity worship and the struggle between evil and good on earth among mankind. The Making of Eve And God cast a sleep upon Adam, and he slept. And God took a rib from the loins on the right side of Adam, and he made Kawa, i.e. Eve, from it. And when Adam woke up and saw Eve, he rejoiced in her greatly. And Adam and Eve were in paradise, and clothed with glory and shining with praise for three hours. Now this paradise was situated on a high range of hills, and it was thirty spans according to the measurement of the Spirit, higher than all the high mountains, and according to our image and likeness. Zelem means a shadow, hence an image from its shadowing forth. In two kings it means idols. Demuth is likeness, likeness in form. It occurs again in this sense in Psalms and Ezekiel. Maimonides explains this to refer not to any corporeal resemblance, but to the divine intellect, philosophically the active as distinguished from the passive intellect, which has been imparted to man. Nefesh ayah. Nefesh is a word, the primary meaning of which is the vital principle common to all living beings. It means here breath of life. The Kavopos order, which adds, And God finished on the sixth day his works which he made. This portion of the verse gives us the invariable form in which the titles of every section of the book of genealogies consisting the Elohistic document begin. It ought to have preceded the history of the creation, which forms the first chapter in the present state of the text. But the editor who finally combined the Elohistic and Jehovistic documents has placed it at the end. It is evident that he wished to begin the sacred book by affirming the doctrine of the creation ex nihilo contained in chapter 1. In opposition to the doctrines of emanation which were held by the pagan nations by whom the Israelites were surrounded. Philo, however, and the Alexandrian Jews saw nothing in the Mosaic cosmogony inconsistent with the pre-existence of matter. Philo, on the incorruptibility of the world, says, As nothing is generated out of nothing, so neither can anything which exists be destroyed, so as to become non-existence. For it is impossible that anything should be generated of that which has no existence anywhere, and equally so that what does exist should be so utterly destroyed as never to be mentioned or heard of again. And indeed, in this spirit, the tragedian says, Not that air has been, completely dies, but things combined, before another union find, quitting their former company, and so again in other forms are seen. From Euripides. In the beginning, on the first day, which was the holy first day of the week, the chief and firstborn of all the days, God created the heavens, and the earth, and the waters, and the air, and the fire, and the hosts which are invisible, that is to say, the angels, archangels, thrones, lords, principalities, powers, cherubim, and seraphim, and all the ranks and companies of spiritual beings in the light, and the night, and the daytime, and the gentle winds and the strong winds, i.e. storms. All these were created on the first day. And on the first day of the week the spirit of holiness one of the persons of the Trinity, hovered over the waters, and through the hovering thereof over the face of the waters, the waters were blessed so that they might become producers of offspring, and they became hot, and the whole nature of the waters glowed with heat, and the leaven of creation was united to them. As the mother bird maketh warm her young by the embrace of her closely covering wings, and the young birds acquire form through the warmth of the heat which they derive from her. So, through the operation of the spirit of holiness, the spirit, the paraclete, the leaven of the breath of life was united to the waters when he hovered over them. Notes. According to Solomon, an Nestorian bishop of parath Meshan, or Al-Basra, a city on the right bank of the Shat al-Arab, about A.D. 1222. The creation of the heavens and the earth has been planned from everlasting and immutable mind of God. 
He created seven substances or natures in silence, without voice, viz. heaven, earth, water, air, fire, the angels, and darkness. The earth was plunged in the midst of the waters. Above the waters was air, and above the air was fire. Water is cold and moist. Air is hot and moist. Fire is hot and dry. But it had no luminosity until the fourth day, when the luminaries were created. The angels are divided into nine classes and three orders. The upper order contains cherubim, seraphim, and thrones, and these are bearers of God's throne. The middle order contains lords, powers, and rulers. The lower order contains principalities, archangels, and angels. Compare the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers of Colossians 1.16. The cherubim are an intellectual motion. The seraphim are a fiery motion. The thrones are a fixed motion. The lords are a motion which governs the motions beneath it and controls the devils. The powers are a motion which gives effect to God's will. The rulers are a motion which rules spiritual measures and the sun, moon, and stars. The principalities are a motion which rules the elements. The archangels are a swift operative motion which governs every living creature except man. And the angels are a motion which has spiritual knowledge of everything which is in heaven or on the earth. The guardian angel of every man belongs to this last class. The number of each class of angels is equal to the number of all mankind from Adam to the resurrection. The heaven in which the angels live is above the waters, which are above the firmament, and they minister to their God there, being invisible to bodily eyes. The angels are not self-existent beings. They were created. On the other hand, darkness is a self-existent nature or substance. The Creation Second day. And on the second day, God made the lower heaven and called it Rekia, that is to say, what is solid and fixed, or firmament. This he did that he might make known that the lower heaven doth not possess the nature of the heaven which is above it, and that it is different in appearance from that heaven which is above it, for the heaven above it is of fire, and that second heaven is Nura, i.e., light. And this lower heaven is Darpishion. And because it hath the dense nature of water, it hath been called Rekia. And on the second day, God made a separation between the waters and the waters, that is to say, between the waters which are above Rekia and the waters which were below. And the ascent of these waters which were above heaven took place on the second day. And they were like unto a dense black cloud of thick darkness. Thus were they raised up there, and they mounted up, and, behold, they stand above the Rekia in the air, and they do not spread, and they make no motion to any side. The creation of the firmament enabled God to allot a dwelling place to the angels. Also the souls of the righteous could be received after the general resurrection. The great abyss of water which God created on the first day was divided by him into three parts. One part he left on the earth for the use of man and beast, and to form rivers and seas. Of the second part he made the firmament, and the third part the place above the firmament. After the resurrection all these parts will return to their original state. The word darpition is a difficulty, and I cannot explain it. The variant forms dirikon and dertikon, appear in Ethiopic books, wherein it is said to be a name of the sixth heaven. The Creation, Third Day And on the third day God commanded the waters that were below the firmament, Rekia, to be gathered together in one place, and the dry land to appear. And when the covering of water had been rolled up from the face of the earth, the earth showed itself to be in an unsettled and unstable state. That is to say, it was of a damp or moist and yielding nature. And the waters were gathered together into seas that were under the earth and within it, and upon it. 
And God made in the earth from below corridors and shafts and channels for the passage of the waters. And the winds which come from within the earth ascend by means of these corridors and channels, and also the heat, and also the wind for the service of the earth. Now, as for the earth, the lower part of it is like unto a thick sponge, for it resteth on the waters. And on this third day God commanded the earth, and it brought forth herbs and vegetables, and it conceived in its interior trees and seeds and plants and roots. Note, on this day the waters gathered together in the depths of the earth. Sand was set as a limit for the waters of the seas, and the mountains and hills appeared. And the sages say that paradise was created on this day, but the rabbis held the view that it existed before the world. Solomon of Albazra says that the earth produced herbs and trees by its own power, and that the luminaries had nothing to do with vegetable growth. Book of the Bee, Chapter 9 The Creation, Fourth Day And on the fourth day God made the sun and the moon and the stars. And as soon as the heat of the sun was diffused over the surface of the earth, the earth became hard and rigid, and lost its flaccidity, because the humidity and the dampness caused by the waters were taken away from it. The Creator made the sphere of the sun of fire, and filled it with light. And God gave unto the sphere of the moon and the stars bodies of water and air, and filled them with light. And when the dust of the earth became hot, it brought forth all the trees, and plants, and seeds, and roots which had been conceived inside it on the third day. Notes. The cases of the sun, moon, and stars were made of aerial or ethereal matter, after the manner of lamps. And God filled them with a mixture of fire which had no light in it, and with light which had no heat in it. The path of the luminaries is beneath the firmament. They are not fixed as the ignorant think, but are guided in their courses by the angels. The Ethiopians have a tradition that when the sun was first made, its light was twelve times as strong as it is today. The angels complained that the heat was too strong and that it hampered them in the performance of their duties, whereupon God divided it into twelve parts, and took away six of these parts, and out of three of them he made the moon and stars and the other three he distributed among the waters, the clouds, and the lightning. The Creation, Fifth Day And on the fifth day God commanded the waters, and they brought forth all kinds of fish of diverse appearances, and creatures which move about and twist themselves and wriggle in the waters, and serpents, and leviathan, and beasts of terrible aspects, and feathered fowl of the air and of the waters. And on this same day God made from the earth all the cattle and wild beasts, and all the reptiles which creep about upon the earth. Notes, according to the Book of the Bee, Chapter 12 Beasts and animals were created on Friday evening, and they can therefore see at night as well as in the daytime. In the Book of Mysteries of Heaven and Earth, whales and the behemoth are mentioned with Leviathan. The Creation, Sixth Day and on the sixth day, which is the eve of the Sabbath, God formed man out of the dust, and Eve from his rib. And on the seventh day, God rested from his labors, and it is called Sabbath, the creation of Adam. Now the formation of Adam took place in this wise. On the sixth day, which is the eve of the Sabbath, at the first hour of the day, when, when quietness was reigning over all the ranks of the angels and the hosts of heaven, God said, Come ye, let us make man in our image, and according to our likeness. Now by this word, us, he maketh known concerning the glorious persons of the Trinity. And when the angels heard this utterance, they fell into a state of fear and trembling. And they said to one another, A mighty miracle will be made manifest to us this day, that is to say, the likeness of God, our Maker. And they saw the right hand of God opened out flat, and stretched out over the whole world. And all creatures were lected in the palm of his right hand. And they saw that he took from the whole mass of the earth one grain of dust, and from the whole nature of water one drop of water, and from all the air which is above one puff of wind, and from the whole nature of fire a little of its heat and warmth. 
and the angel saw that when these four feeble or inert materials were placed in the palm of his right hand, that is to say, wind and heat and dryness and moisture, God formed Adam. Now, for what reason did God make Adam out of these four materials unless it were to show that everything which is in the world should be in subordination to him through them? He took a grain from the earth in order that everything in nature which is formed of earth should be subject unto him, and a drop of water in order that everything which is in the seas and rivers should be his, and a puff of air so that all kinds of creatures which fly in the air might be given unto him and the heat of fire so that all the beings that are fiery in nature and the celestial hosts might be his helpers. God formed Adam with his holy hands in his own image and likeness. And when the angels saw Adam's glorious appearance, they were greatly moved by the beauty thereof. For they saw the image of his face burning with glorious splendor like the orb of the sun. And the light of his eyes was like the light of the sun and the image of his body was like unto the sparkling of crystal. And when he rose at full length and stood upright in the center of the earth, he planted his two feet on that spot whereupon was set up the cross of our Redeemer. For Adam was created in Jerusalem. There he was arrayed in the apparel of sovereignty, and there was the crown of glory set upon his head. There was he made king and priest and prophet. There did God make him to sit upon his honorable throne. And there did God give him dominion over all creatures and things. And all the wild beasts and all the cattle and the feathered fowl were gathered together. And they passed before Adam, and he assigned names to them. And they bowed their heads before him. And everything in nature worshipped him, and submitted themselves unto him. And the angels and the hosts of heaven heard the voice of God saying unto him, Adam, behold, I have made thee king and priest and prophet and lord and head and governor of everything which hath been made and created. And they shall be in subjection unto thee, and they shall be thine. And I have given unto thee power over everything which I have created. And when the angels heard this speech, they all bowed the knee and worshipped him. Notes, the Jews consider that the words, Come, let us make man, refer to God and the angels. But the fathers of the Syrian church understand that God refers to the three persons of the Trinity, some fathers believe that Adam was formed on the morning of the sixth day, outside paradise. But others think that the formation of Adam took place in the evening in paradise. According to some, paradise was created before the world, and according to others, on the third day. Bar Hebraeus says that Adam was created on Friday of the first week of Nisan, April, the first month of the first year of the world. So Nisan is supposed to be New Year's. The Egyptian and Ethiopian churches have a tradition that the angels were not all created at the same time. The great Archangel Michael, who is called the Angel of the Face, and all his rank of angels were created in the first hour of Friday. The priests in the second, and the thrones in the third. The dominions or sultans in the fourth hour of Friday. The lords in the fifth, and the powers in the sixth, the tens of thousands in the seventh, the governors in the eighth, the masters in the ninth. After the governors, the rank of angels governed by Satan were created, and then the tenth rank. According to a Coptic tradition preserved in the Discourse on Abaton, the Angel of Death by Timothy, Archbishop of Rakoti, Alexandria, the clay of which Adam was made was brought by the angel Muriel from the land of the east. When God had made his body, he left it lying for forty days and forty nights without putting breath into it. At the request of our Lord, who promised to become Adam's advocate and to go down into the world, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life three times, saying, Live, 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 according to the type of my divinity. Thereupon Adam rose up and worshipped the Father, saying, My Lord and my God, Budge Coptic Martyrdoms, page 482. The Revolt of Satan and the Battle in Heaven. And when the prince of the lower order of angels saw what great majesty had been given unto Adam, he was jealous of him from that day, and he did not wish to worship him. And he said unto his hosts, Ye shall not worship him, and ye shall not praise him with the angels. 
It is meet that ye should worship me, because I am fire and spirit, and not that I should worship a thing of dust, which hath been fashioned of fine dust. And the rebel made it and the rebel meditating these things would not render obedience to God, and of his own free will he asserted his independence and separated himself from God. But he was swept away out of heaven and fell, and the fall of himself and of all his company from heaven took place on the sixth day, at the second hour of the day. And the apparel of their glorious state was stripped off them, and his name was called Satana, because he turned aside from the right way, and Shaddah because he was cast out, and Daiwa because he lost the apparel of his glory. And behold, from that time until the present day, he and all his hosts have been stripped of their apparel, and they go naked and have horrible faces. And when Satana was cast out from heaven, Adam was raised up so that he might ascend to paradise in a chariot of fire. And the angels went before him, singing praises. And the seraphim ascribed holiness unto him, and the cherubim ascribed blessing. And amid cries of joy and praises, Adam went into paradise. And as soon as Adam entered paradise, he was commanded not to eat of a certain tree. His entrance into heaven took place at the third hour of the eve of the Sabbath, i.e. on Friday morning. Notes, the fathers of the Egyptian and Ethiopian churches treat the story of the fall of Satan in great detail. According to them, Satan, or Satnael, was greatly astonished at the beauty and splendor of the sun and moon. And on the fourth day of the week, he declared to himself that he would set his throne above the stars and make himself equal to God. One week after the creation of Adam, Satan declared war on the hosts of Almighty God. These were commanded by Michael and consisted of 120,000 horsemen, 600,000 shield bearers, 700,000 male clad horsemen in chariots of fire, 700,000 torch bearers, 800,000 angels with daggers of fire, 1 million slingers, 500,000 bearers of axes of fire, and 300,000 bearers of fiery crosses, and 400,000 bearers of lamps. The angels uttered their battle cries and began to fight, but Satan charged them and dispersed them. They reformed, but again Satan charged them and put them to flight. Then God gave the angels the cross of light, which bore the legend, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And when they attacked the hosts of darkness under his cross, Satan became faint, and he and his forces withdrew, and Michael hurled them down into hell. The Abyssinian legend says that Satan was 1,700 cubits high, and his hand 70 cubits long, and his foot 7,000 cubits long. His mouth was 40 cubits in width, his face was as broad as the distance of a day's journey, and the length of his eyebrows was a distance of three days journey. From the Book of the Mysteries of Heaven and Earth The prototype of the great fight in heaven between the powers of light and darkness is found in ancient Egyptian religious texts in more than one form. In the oldest form, Set, the devil, rebels against Her Ur, the god of heaven, whose chief symbol are the sun and moon, and is utterly defeated. In the next form, Set attacks the sun god Ra, and is destroyed by him. The great ally of Set, called Apep or Apophis, and all his friends and devils, the Sibo or Sobao, are defeated and burnt up daily. In another form, Set makes war on Horus, the son of Osiris, and on Osiris himself, and is defeated utterly. The Coptic version of the legend was borrowed from the old hieroglyphic texts and then Christianized. Compare the following. The keepers of paradise were Enoch and Elijah, and in it dwelt the souls of the righteous. The souls of sinners dwelt in a deep place outside Eden. The tree of good and evil that was in paradise did not possess these properties naturally but only through the deed which was wrought by its means. Adam and Eve did not become naked and die the death of sin because they desired and ate of the, fri of the fruit of the fig tree, but because they transgressed the law. The tree of which they ate may have been the fig tree, or the date palm, or the vine, or the ethrog, the citron. 
Mount Eden is probably the original of Jabal Kaf of the Arabs. The symbolism of Eden. Now Eden is the holy church and the church is the compassion of God which he was about to extend to the children of men. For God, according to his foreknowledge, knew what Satan had devised against Adam, and therefore he set Adam beforehand in the bosom of his compassion, even as the blessed Davis singeth concerning him in the psalm at sea, saying, Lord, thou hast been an abiding place for us throughout all generations. That is to say, thou hast made us to have our abiding place in thy compassion. And when entreating God on behalf of the redemption of the children of men, David said, Remember thy church, which thou didst acquire in olden time. Psalm LXXIV 2 That is to say, Remember thy compassion, which thou art about to spread over our feeble race. Eden is the holy church, and the paradise which was in it is the land of rest, and the inheritance of life, which God hath prepared for men for all the holy children of men. And because Adam was priest and king and prophet, God brought him into paradise that he might minister in Eden, the holy church, even as the blessed man Moses testifieth concerning him, saying, that he might serve God by means of priestly ministration with praise, and that he might keep that commandment which had been entrusted to him by the compassion of God. And God made Adam and Eve to dwell in paradise. True is this word, and it proclaimeth the truth. That tree of life which was in the midst of paradise prefigured the redeeming cross, which is the veritable tree of life. And this it was that was fixed in the middle of the earth. Satan's attack on Adam and Eve. And when Satan saw that Adam and Eve were happy and joyful in paradise, that rebel was smitten sorely with jealousy and he became filled with wrath. And he went up and took up his abode in the serpent. And he raised him up and made him to fly through the air to the skirts of Mount Eden, whereon was paradise. Now, why did Satan enter the body of the serpent and hide himself therein? Because he knew that his appearance was foul, and that if Eve saw his form, she would betake herself to flight straight away before him. Now the man who wished to teach the Greek language to a bird now the bird that can learn the speech of men is called Babaga, i.e. the parrot. It first bringeth a large mirror and placeth between himself and the bird. He then beginneth to talk to the bird, and immediately the parrot heareth the voice of the man. It turneth round, and when it seeth its own form reflected in the mirror, it becometh pleased straight away, because it imagineth that a fellow parrot is talking to it. Then it inclineth its ear with pleasure and listeneth to the words of the man who is talking to it, and it becometh eager to learn and to speak Greek. In this manner, i.e. with the object of making Eve believe that it was the serpent that spoke to her, did Satan enter in and dwell in the serpent. And he watched for the opportunity, and when he saw Eve by herself, he called her by her name. And when she turned round towards him, she saw her own form reflected in him, and she talked to him, and Satan led her astray with his lying words, because the nature of woman is soft or yielding. And when Eve had heard from him concerning that tree, straightway she ran quickly to it, and she plucked the fruit of disobedience from the tree of transgression of the command, and she ate. Then immediately she found herself stripped naked, and she saw the hatefulness of her shame, and she ran away naked and hid herself in another tree, and covered her nakedness with the leaves thereof. And she cried out to Adam, and he came to her, and she handed to him some of the fruit of which she had eaten, and he also did eat thereof. And when he had eaten, he also became naked, and he and Eve made girdles for their loins of the leaves of the fig trees, and they were arrayed in these girdles of ignominy for three hours. At midday they received their sentence of doom, and God made for them tunics of skin which was stripped from the trees, that is to say, of the bark of the trees, because the trees that were in paradise had soft barks, and they were softer than the bice, the byssus and silk wherefrom the garments worn by kings are made. And God dressed them in this soft skin, which was thus spread over a body of infirmities. Notes. 
The fathers of the Ethiopian church emphasized the difficulty which Satan found in entering paradise. He knew that he could not carry out his plan for ruining Adam if he entered paradise in his own form, and he decided that he must assume the form of some bird or animal or reptile if he was to succeed. He applied to the white bird Arzel and the green bird Basil and a red bird, but each refused to take him to the place where Eve was. Then he applied to the elephant and a lion and the leopard and the hyena and the wild boar. The first four refused point blank to do what Satan wished, and the wild boar attempted to gore him with his tusks. On this Satan took to flight. He then went to the animal Sareg, which was commonly known as the digger of graves, but this animal refused to help him. And then Satan approached the animal called Taman, the front part of which was like a camel's foal. This creature agreed to help him, and, mounted on his back, Satan entered paradise and stood before Eve. The serpent became spokesman for him, and Eve hearkened to him and ate of the fruit, according to the book of the mysteries of heaven and earth. The tree was called Sezen, and each fruit cluster contained 150,000 grains or berries. It is described as a large and handsome tree, and it has been identified with the Sandale or sandalwood tree. According to the same authorities, the tree of life was the prototype of the cross on which our Lord was crucified. Adam's Stay in Paradise At the third hour of the day, Adam and Eve ascended into paradise. And for three hours they enjoyed the good things thereof. For three hours they were in shame and disgrace. And at the ninth hour their expulsion from paradise took place. And as they were going forth sorrowfully, God spake unto Adam and heartened him, and said unto him, Be not sorrowful, Adam, for I will restore unto thee thine inheritance. Behold, see how greatly I have loved thee. For though I have cursed the earth for thy sake, yet have I withdrawn thee from the operation of the curse. As for the serpent, I have fettered his legs and his belly, and I have given him the dust of the earth for food. And Eve have I bound under the yoke of servitude, inasmuch as thou hast transgressed my commandments, get thee forth. But be not sad. After the fulfillment of the times which I have allotted that, that you shall be in exile outside paradise, in the land which is under the curse, behold, I will send my son, and he shall go down from heaven for thy redemption, and he shall sojourn in a virgin, and shall put on a body of flesh, and through him redemption and a return shall be effected for thee. But command thy sons, and order them to embalm thy body after thy death with myrrh, Cassia and Stockti, and they shall place thee in this cave, wherein I am making you to dwell this day, until the time when your expulsion shall take place from the regions of paradise to that earth which is outside it, and whosoever shall be left in those days shall take thy body with him, and shall deposit it on the spot which I shall sow him in the center of the earth, for in that place shall redemption be effected for thee and for all thy children. And God revealed unto Adam everything which the son would suffer on behalf of him. Adam's Expulsion from Paradise And when Adam and Eve had gone forth from paradise, the door of paradise was shut, and a cherub bearing a two-edged sword stood by it. According to the Book of the Bee, the cherub, or as some think, a terrible form endowed with a body, was armed with a spear and sword, each being made of fire. And Adam and Eve went down in, of spirit over the mountains of paradise, and they found a cave in the top of the mountain, and they entered and hid themselves therein. When Adam and Eve left paradise, they no longer had fruit and wine and bread and flesh to live upon, and they subsisted on cooked grain and vegetables and the herbs of the earth, of which they ate sparingly. Moreover, the four-footed beasts and fowl and reptiles rebelled against them, and some of them became enemies and adversaries unto them. Book of the Bee, Chapter 17 Now Adam and Eve were virgins, and Adam wished to know Eve his wife. And Adam took from the skirts of the mountain of paradise gold and myrrh and frankincense, and he placed them in the cave. And he blessed the cave and consecrated it, that it might be the house of prayer for himself and his sons. And he called the cave Mi'arath Gaz, i.e. the cave of treasures. So Adam and Eve went down from that holy mountain of Eden, to the slopes which were below it. And there Adam knew Eve his wife. 
A marginal note in the manuscript says that Adam knew Eve 30 years after they went forth from paradise, and Eve conceived and brought forth Cain and Lubuda, his sister, with him. And Eve conceived again, and she brought forth Habil, Abel, and Kelimoth, his sister, with him. The Book of the Bee makes Kelimoth the twin sister of Cain, and Labuda the twin sister of Abel. And when the children grew up, Adam said unto Eve, Let Cain take to wife Kelimoth, who is brought forth with Abel, and let Abel take to wife Labuda, who is brought forth with Cain. And Cain said unto Eve his mother, I will take to wife my twin sister Labuda, and let Abel take to wife his twin sister Kelimoth. Now Labuda was beautiful. When Adam heard these words, which were exceedingly displeasing unto him, he said, It will be a transgression of the commandment for thee to take to wife thy sister, who is born with thee. Nevertheless, take ye to yourselves fruits of trees and the young of sheep, and get ye up to the top of this holy mountain. Then go ye into the cave of treasures, and offer ye up your offerings, and make your prayers, and then ye shall consort with your wives. And it came to pass that when Adam, the first priest, and Cain and Abel, his sons, were going up to the top of the mountain, Satan entered into Cain and persuaded him to kill Abel, his brother, because of Labuda, and because his offering was rejected and was not accepted before God, whilst the offering of Abel was accepted. Cain's jealousy of his brother Abel was increased. And when they came down to the plain, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and he killed him with a blow from a stone of flint. Then straightway Cain received the doom of death instead of curses, and he became a fugitive and a wanderer all the days of his life. And God drove him forth into exile in a certain part of the forest of Nod, or Nod. And Cain took to wife his twin sister and made the place of his abode there. Notes. Adam carried Abel to the cave of treasures and buried him therein. And he set by the side of the body a lamp which burned day and night. Abel was fifteen and a half years old when Cain, who was seventeen and a half years old, murdered him. Adam and Eve mourned for Abel, in great grief for one hundred and forty days. Book of Adam and Eve The Birth of Seth And Adam and Eve mourned for Abel one hundred years, and then Adam knew his wife again, and she brought forth Seth, the beautiful, a man mighty and perfect like unto Adam. And he became the father of the mighty men who lived before the flood. Notes, Seth was born in the 130th year of Adam's life. But the book of the bee says it was the 230th year. Adam and Seth and his sons dwelt on the top of Mount Eden, while Cain and his children lived on the plain below. The Posterity of Seth And to Seth was born Anosh, Enos, and Anosh begot Canaan, Canaan, and Canaan begot Mahalal, Mahalil, and these are the patriarchs who were born in the days of Adam, the death of Adam. And when Adam had lived 930 years, that is to say, until the 135th year of Mahalal, the day of his death drew nigh and came. And Seth his son, and Anosh, and Canaan, and Mahalal gathered themselves together and came to him, and they were blessed by him, and he prayed over them. And he commanded his son Seth, and said unto him, Observe my son Seth, that which, I, that which I command thee this day, and do thou on the day of thy death give my command to Anosh, and repeat it to him. And let him repeat it to Canaan, and Canaan shall repeat it to Mahala. And let this my command be handed on to all your generations. And when I die, embalm me with myrrh, and cassia, and stock tea, and deposit my body in the cave of treasures. And whosoever shall be left of your generations in that day, when you are going forth from this country which is round about paradise, shall take place, shall carry my body with him, and shall take it and deposit it in the center of the earth. For in that place shall redemption be effected for me and for all my children. And be thou, O my son Seth, governor of the sons of thy people, and thou shalt rule them purely and holily in and the fear of God. And keep ye your offspring separate from the offspring of Cain the murderer. And when the report Adam is dying was known generally, all his offspring gathered together and came to him. That is to say, Seth his son, and Anosh, and Canaan, and Malalal, they and their wives, 
and their sons and their daughters, and Adam blessed them. And the departure of Adam from this world took place in the 930th year, according to the reckoning from the beginning, on the 14th day of the moon, on the 6th day of the month of Nisan, April, at the ninth hour, on the day of the eve of the Sabbath, i.e. the Friday, at the same hour in which the Son of Man delivered up his soul to his Father on the cross, did our father Adam deliver up his soul to him that fashioned him, and he departed from this world. And when Adam was dead, his son Seth embalmed him, according as Adam had commanded him, with myrrh and cassia and stockti. Now Adam's dead body was the first body buried in the earth, and grief for him was exceedingly sore. And Seth and his sons mourned for his death 140 days, and they took Adam's body up to the top of the mountain and buried it in the cave of treasures. And after the families and peoples of the children of Seth had buried Adam, they separated themselves from the children of Cain the murderer. And Seth took Anosh, her, his firstborn, and Canaan and Malalal and their wives and children and led them up into the glorious mountain where Adam was buried. And Cain and all his descendants remained below on the plain where Cain slew Abel, the rule of Seth. And Seth became the governor of the children of his people, and he ruled them in purity and holiness. And because of their purity they received the name, which is the best of all names, and were called the sons of God. They and their wives and their sons. Thus they lived in that mountain, in all purity and holiness, and in the fear of God. And they went up on the skirts of the mountain of paradise, and they became praisers and glorifiers of God in the place of that host of devils who fell from heaven. There they dwelt in peace and happiness. There was nothing about which they needed to feel anxiety. They had nothing to weary or trouble them, and they had nothing to do except to praise and glorify God with the angels. For they heard continually the voices of the angels who were singing praises in paradise, which was situated at no great height above them. In fact, only about thirty spans, according to the measure of the Spirit. So as I was saying there, that it's because they're at the North Pole and they're on Mount Meru or just below Mount Meru and just above them at Mount Meru and above it is paradise. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou from among all cattle and from among every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Upon thy breast and belly he shall keep watch against thy head, and thou shalt keep his heel. No serpent could bruise a person's head, Josephus says that all living creatures at this time were able to speak and had one language. He attributes the fall to the serpent's envy of the happiness of Adam and Eve. God, he says, deprived the serpent of speech and put poison under his tongue, not knowing that out of some one thousand varieties of serpents, perhaps one half are not poisonous. Certain land snakes use the tongue to bring into the mouth stones, sand, etc., which they swallow to promote digestion which has been mistaken for eating dust. Professor Owen has shown in his description of the Ophidia, in allusion to the text, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, that serpents have not been degraded from a higher type, and that no animal has its parts more exquisitely adapted to its necessities. M. Lenormont observes in The Origins of History that the serpent has been assuredly a symbol of life for the Chaldeo-Assyrians. One of its generic names in the Semitic Assyrian languages, Havav, in Arabic Haya, both from the root Hava to live. The brazen serpent of numbers, which Yahweh himself ordered Moses to make, was an emblem of Yahweh as a healing deity. This serpent continued to be an object of popular worship until the time of Hezekiah, who broke it in pieces because the Israelites burnt incense to it up to that time and he called it Nehushtan, that is, brazen. Rus has observed that there is a pun here, for
or serpent is called Nahash and brass of Nahasheth. There is no mention of the devil in connection with the serpent until the apocryphal Book of Wisdom, which is of later date than the Septuagint. Even this seems to be figurative. In Ecclesiastes, it is said, The covenant from the beginning is, Thou shalt die the death. And, it is said, When the ungodly curseth Satan, he curseth his own soul. Lenormand says, One of the images of Malak Baal, the third person of the Phoenician triad, as the Nebushtin, the savior serpent, whose image Moses set up in the desert. The rabbis attributed Adam's fall to the to the envy of the angels who having in vain tried to prevent the creation of man led him in by means of Samael and his angels who were superior to them and who employed the serpent as his instrument if Adam had not sinned he would have lived forever according to some the immediate consequence of Adam's sin was that the Shekinah was withdrawn from earth to the first heaven and subsequent sins caused it to be removed to the seventh heaven. The Shekinah was a light created expressly in order to represent the divine majesty. The Talmud says that God originally offered the law to all Gentile nations, but they having refused to submit, Israel took the law on themselves at Mount Sinai and were literally, as Psalms describes, I said, Ye are Elohim, and all of you sons of Elyon, the Most High. If it had not been for the golden calf which put an end to this state of bliss, that generation would have seen the end of Israel. Dr. Donaldson has a dissertation on this verse, in which he shows from Jeremiah and Nahum the real meaning of the word translated bread, the real meaning of the word, of the word translated heal. The same word is used for the tree of life that is used in chapters 1, 2, etc. for fruit bearing and other trees in general. The idea of a tree of life is common to many nations, and everywhere it is the increase of vital energy given by the intoxicating powers of the fruit which has made semi-barbarous nations believe in a promise of immortality conveyed by it. In Aria, or Aria, we have the Soma, the Asclepios Acidula, or Acidula. In Babylonia, the palm and the Akkadian inscriptions show us that ancient people gave the name Gestin, the tree of life, to the vine. R. Meyer taught that the tree Adam partook of was the vine, for nothing entices man so much as wine, of which it is said, and he drank of the vine and was drunken. In the LXX, this verse is, And he cast out Adam and caused him to dwell over against the garden of delight, and stationed the cherubs and the fiery sword that turns about to keep the way of the tree of life. There seems to be no doubt that the cherubim are of Babylonian origin, and identical with the winged colossal bulls. M. Lenormand says that upon an unedited parallel inscription in the possession of M. Leclerc in Paris, the legend on Kiribu Damku, the exalted cherub, appears. In Ezekiel 1.10, the cherubim have the face of a bull. Ezekiel represents them in chapter 1.6 as having four faces. But in chapter 19.18 is this number reduced to two. And Clemens Alexandrinus said that they represented the two hemispheres, in their wings the rapid movement of the firmament and of time circulating in the zodiac. For Philo, speaking of the wings of the cherubim, says the heavens fly.
And he said, Who told thee that thou art naked? Hast thou eaten from the tree which I commanded thee not to eat of? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest with me, she gave to me of the tree, and I ate. And Yahweh, Elohim, said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou above all the cattle, and above all beasts of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and earth shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and between the woman, and between thy seed and between her seed. She shall lie in wait for thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will multiply thy pain, and thy conception. In pain shalt thou bear children, and thy desire shall be unto thy husband. And he shall rule over thee. And to the man he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat from it, cursed is the ground on thy account. With pain shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life and thorn and bramble shall it cause to grow to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. With sweat of thy face shalt thou eat food until thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, because earth thou art, and unto earth shalt thou return. And the man called the name of his wife Hava, because she was mother of all living, and Yahweh Elohim made to the man and to his wife tunics of hide, and clothed them. And Yahweh Elohim said, Lo, the man has been as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he shall put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of the lives, and eat, and live forever, Yahweh Elohim sent him from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And he drove out the man, and he caused to dwell at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubim, and the flame of the sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of the lives. The sentence pronounced by Yahweh on the three culprits is in accordance with their different degrees of guilt. Oh, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy son and her son. He will remember thee what thou didst to him at from the beginning and thou shalt be observant unto him at the end. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thy feet shall be cut off, and thy skin thou shalt cast away once in seven years, and the poison of death shall be in thy mouth, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between the seed of thy son and the seed of her sons. And it shall be when the sons of the woman keep the commandments of the law, thou wilt be ready to wound them in their heel. O, oh, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife vestments of honor upon the skin of their flesh, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, man is become singular, or alone, as a branch. In the world by himself, man is become singular in the world by himself, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he stretch forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. And the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he had been created. And he drove out the man. And before the garden of Eden, he caused to dwell the Kerubiah, and the sharp sword which revolved, to keep the way of the tree of life. And the Lord God made to Adam, and to his wife vestures of honor from the skin of the serpent which he had cut from him upon the skin of their flesh instead of that adornment which had been cast away and he clothed them and the Lord God said to the angels who ministered before him behold Adam is soul on the earth as I am soul in the heavens above and it will be that they will arise from him who will know how to discern between good and evil had he kept the commandments which I appointed to him he would have lived and subsisted on the tree of life forever. But now, because he hath not kept that which I prescribed, it is decreed against him that we keep him from the garden of Eden. 
And the Lord God removed him from the Garden of Eden, and he went and dwelt on Mount Moriah to cultivate the ground from which he had been created. And he drove out the man from thence where he had made to dwell the glory of his Shekinah, at the first between the two Kerubiah. Before he had created the world, he created the law. He prepared the Garden of Eden for the righteous, that they may eat and delight themselves with the fruit of the tree, because they would have practiced in their lives the doctrine of the law in this world, and have maintained the commandments. But he prepared Gehinnom for the wicked, which is like the sharp consuming sword of two edges. In the midst of it he hath prepared flakes of fire and burning coals for the judgment of the wicked, who rebelled in their life against the doctrine of the law. To serve the law is better than to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, the law. The sentence pronounced by Yahweh on the three culprits is in accordance with their different degrees of guilt. The serpent had not only tempted Eve to disobedience, but had told her that Yahweh had deceived them, and that she and her husband would not die from eating the fruit. Adam and Eve were created mortal, or the tree of life would have been unnecessary. But Adam lived to be 930 years old. The heaviest sentence, therefore, is pronounced upon the serpent. Eve is sentenced to the pains of childbirth, though she pleads that the serpent had been allowed to beguile her. Adam is not cursed at all, but the ground is cursed for his sake. It is to bring forth thorns and brambles, which were therefore a new creation, and his food is limited to the herb of the field. To this is added the sentence of physical death. With sweat of thy face shalt thou eat food until thou return to the ground, because earth thou art and unto earth thou shalt return, thus excluding any idea of immortality hereafter. The origin of these serpent myths, so various in their form, is probably the tendency shown in the Veda to personify the phenomena of nature. In primitive religions, physical evil is first noticed, and the Aryan Ahi or Vritra, who menaces heaven and earth with ruin, and against whom beings, protectors of mankind, are ever near Indra, as auxiliaries in his contest with him, usually signifies the clouds, which, covering the sky, keep the fertilizing rain from the arid earth in their dark recesses, as in a cave. Ahi is also called Dasa, the enemy, the destroyer. In the Avesta, the same character is attributed to him, only Aji, as he is called in Zend, is no longer the author of physical, but of moral evil. This serpent, the Haka, that is, who wounds and destroys, was created by Ahraman to destroy moral purity and is a wicked deceiver. The Nasim, or Ophites, held that the serpent raised Adam and Eve to the knowledge of the existence of higher beings than the demiurge of the present world and that by inducing Eve to procreate, he was the preserver of the species, which would otherwise have died out. All the gross anthropomorphisms, such as Yahweh walking in the garden, making garments for Adam and his wife, coming down from heaven to see whether the guilt of the city had been accurately reported to him, wrestling with Jacob and so forth, belonged to the Jehovist, Maimonides, energetically protested against these descriptions when taken in a literal sense. In the Elohist, the patriarchs are decorous, if colorless, abstractions. In the Jehovist, not only do they repeatedly sin against the laws of ordinary morality, but the vengeance of Yahweh is frequently directed not against the sinner, but against unconscious offenders. Centuries later, we find the same idea in Josephus, who says that Jehovah punished Theopompus the historian for giving an account of the Jewish creed by making him lose his senses for 30 days. As in the case of Abimelech, he was told the cause of his malady in a dream, viz. that he had spread the knowledge of divine things among profane men. Theodectes the tragedian also put some passages of scripture into one of his tragedies and was struck with blindness for it, but being made sensible of his fault and having atoned to Jehovah for it, his sight was restored. 
Professor Sace, Modern Review, October 1882, thinks that Yahweh was a Hittite god. The Hittites are brought into special connection with Abraham in the south of Palestine, in Genesis and David, who reigned at Hebron before he reigned at Jerusalem, while making war on the Semitic Aramaeans of Damascus and Zobah, was in alliance with the Hittite king of Hamath. The alliance lasted long, and when in later days a panic fell upon the Syrians, they at once concluded that the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites. 2 Kings 12.6 Tu, or Toy, itself a non-Semitic name, was the king of Hamath, who sent his son Jeram to form a league with David, and that Yahu is the first element in the name of Joran seems evident from the form Hadaram, which takes its place in 1 Chronicle 27 or 28. I have tried to show elsewhere that Hadad was the Semitized form of Datis or Attis, the Hittite god of the air, and that when Macrobius makes Adad the supreme god of the Syrians, and says that the word means one, he is referring not to the Semitic Syrians, but to the people of Hierapolis and its neighborhood, the white Syrians of Strabo. However, this may be a later king of Hamath in the time of Sargon when the city appears to have passed into the hands of the Semites. It's called by the Assyrians Yahu Bidi in one place, and Hu Bidi in another. And since Hu is the Hebrew El God, it would seem that Yahu must have been as much as the supreme deity as Hamath as he was of Judah. It is therefore significant that the Hittite captain in David's army was named Uriah. Outside Hamath and Israel, the inscriptions neither of Assyria nor of Egypt reveal any names of which Yahu forms part. After the return from captivity, the strictest monotheism prevailed. Even the heretical Samaritans preferred the singular El to the plural Elohim as proclaiming more distinctly the unity of God. Maimonides will not allow any attributes of the deity to be enumerated, for he considers God and his attributes to be identical. Passages may be found in the Apocrypha which tend to modify the rude expressions of the Hebrew text and make the people understand that these expressions were types, not realities. But it is in the Targums of Vonkelos and Jonathan that these modifications are prominently brought forward. Both these Targums interpret the tree of life to mean the law. When God is represented as speaking with men, the word of God, or the glory of God, the Shekinah, the dwelling or the abiding presence, is always substituted. Isaiah 1.15, I will hide mine eyes, is paraphrased the visage of the majesty of Jehovah. Genesis 15.1 is paraphrased. After these things came Pithgama, the word of Jehovah, M, unto Abram in prophecy, saying, Fear not, Abram, my Manara shall be thy strength, and thy very great reward. In Genesis 4:27, it is the Shekinah of God that dwells in the tents of Shem. The Samaritan poets, Carmen, Samarit, Lipsii of 1824, have the same idea. They say, God has spoken, yet he has no mouth. He sustains the world, yet he has no hands. He has created the world, and is not fatigued, and has rested on the seventh day, and is not wearied. In general, there has been since the return from captivity, a slow, though often retarded, progress in Judaism, not only to more spiritual views, but to reform of ancient institutions. In the Talmud Sanhedrin 80, a rabbi declares that if the law were regarded as absolutely completed, it could have no stability. And in the treatise Baba Maziah, another rabbi teaches, the destruction of Jerusalem took place because the judges judged without consulting the spirit according to the letter of the law. The early religion of the Hebrews as represented in Genesis was, like most religions in their infancy, one of extreme simplicity. Spencer has shown that the sacrifices in the Old Testament were not ordered by God, but were voluntary offerings of what was best and most precious. In animal sacrifices it was the usual practice to lay the blood and fat upon the altar, while the people consumed the flesh. 
In Isaiah 1.12, Yahweh says of the sacrifices, Who hath required this at your hand? In Jeremiah 7.12, he says, I spake not unto your fathers concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. In Constant Apost, Abel, Noah, and Abraham are said to have brought victims of their own accord. Justin Martyr, or whoever was the author, also says, Response ad quest, that God never ordered any sacrifice for his own pleasure. And Chrysostom says the same thing. Vicarious atonement was contrary to the spirit of Mosaism. In Exodus, chapter 32, 33, Yahweh says to Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And in Deuteronomy, it is said, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. In Genesis, Jacob takes the stone which he had placed under his head and sets it up as a pillar and pours oil on the top of it and calls the place Beth El, the house of God. It is curious to observe that in the primitive Aryan religion, also the head of the family, who is also the worshipper or priest, used to erect in the open air a stone which was wide at its basis, which made the place where it was set up sacred. This altar was consecrated by the Aryan shepherd by being anointed with liquid butter. On his knees or standing with his hands extended towards heaven, he invoked the deity and sang improvised prayers. Wood was placed on the altar, and fire being obtained by the rapid rubbing together two sticks. And the juice of the suna plant thrown upon it, and the flame consumed the oblation, which might be butter, curdled milk, or victims taken from the flocks. Unlike many other nations in which religious rites are numerous and complicated, the Hebrews had at this time neither marriage ceremonies nor funeral rites. Marriage was a purely social institution among the Aryans also, and there is no trace in the hymns of any religious ceremony accompanying it. Only in a hymn addressed to the Adidas, it is said, Preserve me from evil as from an illegitimate child, which shows that the institution had a sacred character. In the Gatas Yak, there is an exhortation to those who marry to be sincere to one another. There is no trace of funeral rites in Genesis under the deaths of Jacob and Joseph, but they take place in Egypt. Abraham mourns and weeps for Sarah and purchases the cave, Machpelah, where the Jews say that Adam is buried, that he may bury his dead out of his sight, but neither on this nor any other occasion is there any mention of funeral ceremonies. The Aryans in ancient times had no funeral ceremonies either but they prayed over their dead until the burial was finished, and these prayers show that their ideas of another world had become developed. Go, they said, set forth for those ancient paths which our ancestors have trodden, thou wilt see the two kings, Yama and the god Varuna, who take pleasure in oblations. Go with the ancestors, with Yama, with the happiness thou hast deserved, to the highest heaven. When the dead was about to be consigned to earth, they said, Draw near to our Mother Earth, that wide-spreading and ample dispenser of happiness, that virgin soft as wool for those that follow the right path. May she keep thee from the brink of calamity. And when the dead person is deposited in a grave and the earth is thrown upon him, some such words as the following were sung. Raise thyself, O Earth, do him no harm, receive him kindly. Cover him, O Earth, as the mother embraces her offspring. Maimonides gives a list of the Noachid laws which the rabbis held should be the groundwork of missionary efforts. The first man was commanded concerning six things, idolatry, blasphemy, shedding of blood, incest, robbery, and administration of justice. Although we have all these things as a tradition from Moses, our master and reason inclines to them, yet from the general tenor of the law, it appears that he was commanded concerning these things. Noah received an additional command concerning the limb of living animal, not to be eaten, as it is said, But flesh in the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. Genesis 9.4 Here are the seven commandments. And thus the matter was in all the world until Abraham. Upon the apologue or philosophical disquisition 
as Josephus calls it, of the Garden of Eden. The Greek and Roman Catholic churches have founded the doctrine of the eternal damnation of every unbaptized person. The General Council of Africa, held in AD 418 upon Pelagianism, excommunicated those who held that Adam was subject to death when he was born. The council held that he only became mortal after his fall and that all the children of men who came into the world shared in the crime committed by their first parent, a crime which could only be affected by baptism. Fulgentins says of original sin, Hold thou most firmly, nor do thou in any respect doubt that infants, whether in their mother's wombs, they begin to live and there die, or when after their mothers have given birth to them they pass from this life without the sacrament of holy baptism will be punished with the everlasting punishment of eternal fire. The Council of Trent defines as of faith that Adam lost original justice not only for himself but also for us, that he poured sin which is the death of the soul into the whole human race, and that this sin comes not by imitation of Adam's transgression but by propagation from him. Augustine was compelled to acknowledge that unbaptized infants had better not have been born but denies emphatically that a separate place or a limbo is assigned to them, and in a sermon against the Pelagians distinctly declares that they descend into everlasting fire. These doctrines became formulated. The terror among mothers was so great that they took every precaution they could think of to protect their children. Baptismal water was sprinkled on the womb. Stillborn children were baptized, and mother would receive the host or obtain absolution and apply them to the benefit of the child but the priests anathemized all these attempts. See Lecky, The History of Rationalism. In the Greek church, not only, un, not only the unbaptized child, but its parents also are damned. Exorcism is retained in both churches, and until this ceremony is completed, the devil is said to be in possession of the child. The doctrine of original sin is entirely unknown to Judaism. The Talmud teaches that the evil desire or impulse was created by God, and in several passages it is said that, the, that he repented having done so on seeing the consequences. Everyone, however, can overcome sin by study and works and obtain righteousness. In Isaiah, Yahweh says, I make peace and create evil. Job says, What, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In Lamentations it is said, Out of the mouth of Elion cometh there not evil and good? And in Ezekiel Yahweh says, Yet say ye, Wherefore doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? When the Son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In the apocryphal book of Enoch, which, however, is quoted as scripture in Jude, verse 14, it is said, When righteousness shall be manifested in the presence of the righteous themselves, who will be elected for their good works, duly weighed by the Lord of Spirits, and when the light of the righteous and the elect who dwell on earth shall be manifested, where will the habitation of sinners be? And where the place of rest for those who have rejected the Lord of Spirits? It would have been better for them had they never been born. The Jewish hell is much more merciful than the Christian one. Souls come out of hell on Friday evening and only return on Saturday when the prayer is finished. Manasseh says, Even the wicked, of whom it is said that they descend into hell and ascend not into heaven, enjoy rest on the Sabbath. The rabbis held that all souls were created on the first day of creation. The angels wished to prostrate themselves with reverence before the first man. For a virtuous man is above the highest angels. In Nida, it is said that the soul of man, the divine light, is by its nature pure, stainless, and moral in the highest degree. All pre-existing souls are in a place called guf, body. Raskai, in his commentary, says that Guf is the space between the Shekinah and the dwelling place of the angels. 
the spirits and souls which were created during the first days of creation, and which will one day inhabit human bodies, are all there. Our Jose says that the Messiah will not come till there are no more souls in the goof. The Talmud places the goof at the summit of heaven, in the seventh heaven, Arabat, where justice and virtue, peace and benedictions, in a word all the souls that are to be created, exist. In some Jewish prayer books in use among the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, part of the morning service is, My God, the soul which thou hast given me is pure. Thou hast created, formed, and breathed it into me. Thou dost also carefully guard it within me. Thou wilt hereafter take it from me, and restore it unto me in futurity. A learned rabbi quoted by Hornbeck says, The Jews deny original sin, and that for the most weighty reasons. For the seed of sin is exclusively in the soul, and all souls derive their origin, not from Adam, but from God the Creator. Whence it follows that the descendants of Adam could not have sinned. That sin is seated in the soul is evident, for that vice or delinquency is seated in the soul or intellect. And the scripture expressly declares that soul shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be upon him, or in it. Hence then, it may be clearly perceived that sin is seated in the soul. In like manner, that souls are created by God, without the mediation of any instrument, is testified by Isaiah. The spirit should fail before me, and the souls which I have made. Ezekiel confirms this same when he represents God as saying, All souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Hence, then, it clearly and certainly follows that the souls of Adam's posterity could not have sinned in him, and that all mankind are born obnoxious to the punishment due to the sin of Adam, which, as they are all corporal, affects the bodies of all his children, inasmuch as they are his children with respect to their bodies. Just as, if a man be brought into a state of slavery, all his children become slaves also in consequence of being the offspring of an enslaved parent. In an article on the Talmud by Emanuel Deutsch in the Quarterly Review, it is stated that there is no death without individual sin, no pain without individual transgression. That same spirit that dictated in the Pentateuch, and parents shall not die for their children, nor the children for their parents, has ordained that no one shall be punished for another's transgressions. The article goes on to say that in the judgment of sin, the animus is considered. The desire to commit sin is more wicked than the sin itself. Everything is in God's hand except the fear of God. So every human being, so every human being can carry out a virtuous existence. Only the help of God is requisite for it. The righteous are to rise by the mystic power of the dew of life in Jerusalem. The Targums add on Mount Olivet. There is no everlasting damnation. Even for the worst sinners, idolaters, apostates, traitors, there is only temporary punishment, though it may last generation upon generation. But the sinner has only to repent sincerely, and he is forgiven. No human being of whatever creed or nation is excluded from the world to come. The notion of Elijah or Moses having ascended to heaven is utterly repudiated. At the Reformation, the doctrine of original sin became, like other doctrines of the Church, the subject of discussion. Luther described the teaching of Paul as to the derivation of human sin from Adam as a laughable doctrine. He asks, what can be more ridiculous than the fact that Adam took a bite of an apple should have the tremendous result of putting all men to the very end of the world into the power of death? For, he says, he had committed neither murder nor adultery, he had robbed no one, nor blasphemed God, nor committed any of the horrible sins of which the world is now full, but only eaten the apple, over-persuaded and deceived by the devil, through the woman. Must we then, says reason, make this single apple of so much account that the whole world must pay for it, and so many fine, excellent, wise folk, yea, God's Son himself, with all prophets, fathers, and saints, must die? Auslagung in Corinthians, he speaks afterwards of faith strangling reason, but as he made use of reason in so many other instances, as in his rejection of the Apocalypse, the preface to which had to be suppressed, 
It is not clear why he did not employ it in this instance also. Zunglius held that original sin was nothing more than a malady or evil tendency, and did not in any way involve guilt. Erasmus distinguished between those who received the sacrament of baptism without accompanying grace, and those who answered to it with newness of life, and says of hell, There is no other flame in which the sinner is plagued, and no other punishment of hell, than the perpetual anguish of mind which accompanies habitual sin. Jeremy Taylor said on this subject that every man is inclined to evil, some more, some less, but all in some instances is very true, and it is an effect or condition of nature, but none sin properly, one, because that which is unavoidable is not a sin, and two, because it is accidental to nature, not intrinsical and essential, three, it is superinduced to nature and is after it. Locke, in his commonplace book, has laid down the golden rule on these subjects. No one should believe any proposition that is contrary to reason, on the authority of either inspiration or miracle, for the reality of the inspiration or miracle can only be established by reason. The chronology of Genesis is obviously limited by the dates assigned for the creation and deluge. The modern Jewish Chronology makes the creation to have taken place on September 10th, B.C. 3761. This date was fixed in A.D. 360 by R. Hillel, when the cycle of Miton was finally adapted, and they say that this form of the year is to continue till the coming of the Messiah. According to this chronology, the deluge took place in B.C. 2104. Babel was built B.C. 1969. Abraham was born B.C. 1812. The confusion of tongues took place B.C. 1764. The descent to Egypt was in B.C. 1522. And the exodus took place B.C. 1312. Josephus, who had in his possession the temple copy of the Old Testament, which was in use at the fall of Jerusalem, and must therefore have had the actual numbers before him, places the creation in B.C. 5688, or, as corrected by Dr. Hales, in B.C. 5411, while R. Lippmann places that event as late as B.C. 3616. There is thus a difference of some 2,000 years between the different Jewish calculations. In modern times, the longest period was that introduced on astronomical grounds by Alfonso X. King of Leon in Castile. He fixed the date of the creation at BC 6984, but the astronomical system followed by him was, like the cosmological system adopted by all the fathers and by Milton, the Ptolemaic, according to which the Earth was the center of the universe. Other opinions, too numerous to mention, vary from that of the Ecumenical Council held at Constantinople in AD 381, which adopted the year BC 5509 as the date of the creation, to that of Jerome who fixes it in BC 3941. In this country the received chronology has long been that of Archbishop Usher, according to whom the world was created in BC 4004, and the deluge took place in BC 2349. About 50 years ago, Dr. Hales adopted the longer chronology of Josephus, which he reduced to a system which gave the year of the creation as B.C. 5411, and that of the deluge as B.C. 3155. In this system, Noah and his sons are transported somehow from Armenia to Egypt, where they reign from B.C. 3155 to B.C. 2612, 543 years after which they are succeeded by Mishraim and his successors. Usher's dates are now again assumed as the approximate ones, and we are informed that in the year BC 2350, or thereabouts, the whole of the then known world was destroyed, and that it is absolutely certain that the whole human race, except eight persons, had perished. Well, May Bunsen says, it ought long ago to have been a settled point that our present popular and school chronology is a fable strung together by ignorance and fraud, and persisted in out of superstition and a want of intellectual energy. 
The Jewish conception of the universe is that it was created expressly for them. In Yalkut, it is said that God created the world on account of Israel, and for their merit, preparing for them as a king does who foresees the birth of his son. Adam and his wife spoke the language which Yahweh conversed with them in, and which was Hebrew. They considered this the fountainhead of all the languages in the world. Josephus tells us that all living creatures had but one language, and both the names which Adam gives to Eve are Hebrew. The seed of Abraham, the chosen ones, was under the special care of Yahweh. As for the other people which also come of Adam, thou hast said that they are nothing, but be like unto spittle, and hast likened the abundance of them unto a drop that falleth from a vessel. With such ideas the legend of a deluge in which all mankind perished with the exception of Noah, who according to the Talmud married Namah, the daughter of Enoch, and his family seemed perfectly natural. The following is the Chaldean account of the deluge in an abbreviated form. Kasis Sadra, the Suthros, relates the story of his deliverance to Iztubar, an ancient Babylonian hero, as follows. The gods, Anu, the warrior Bel, the throne bearer Adar, Inuji, the prince, and Aya, the lord of inscrutable wisdom, had assembled in the ancient city Surapak on the Euphrates and had resolved to bring about a flood. Pa'aus announced this determination to Kasasadra and ordered him to build the ship of certain prescribed dimensions and to take refuge in it with his family and servants. Everything necessary for subsistence was to be stored within the ship and cattle and wild animals of the field were to be brought beneath its shelter in order to preserve seed of life of every kind. During six days and seven nights, storm, flood, and tempest roam abroad and cast down to the ground. On the seventh day the tempest subsides and the sea retires and the evil wind and flood cease. Kasasadra traverses the sea which bears along on its surface corpses like the stems of trees. He opens the roof window of the vessel, and light streams over his countenance, and tears flow down it. Wheresoever he directs his gaze, no land is to be seen. The ship speeds to the land Nasir. The mountain of the land Nasir holds the vessel fast, and there Kasasadra waits until the earth becomes dry. Then he offers there a sacrifice to the gods. In the Jehovah's Noah and his family are ordered to go into the ark and take with him seven pairs of clean and two of unclean animals and birds. This distinction is not found either in the cuneiform legend or in the Elohist. The deluge is forty days upon the earth, and all living things are destroyed, but nothing is said about the waters rising over the tops of the mountains. The whole narrative resembles the account of an inundation rather than of a deluge. The sending forth of the birds and the erection of an altar to Yahweh are also peculiar to this account, which is inconsistent with that of the Elohist. For if Noah had only taken two of every sort of animal, the species which he offered as burnt offerings would have been destroyed. The deluge is brought about in the Elohist in quite a different manner, and with more detail. Not only are the floodgates of heaven opened, but the fountains of the great deep are broken up and thus the waters under the earth combine with the waters above to bring about the catastrophe. In the cuneiform legend, the Anunnaki, the gods of the subterranean water, bring floods. When the deluge is at its greatest height, it is fifteen cubits above the highest mountain under the whole heaven. Wellhausen remarks that the legend is spoiled by Noah's heaving the lead and marking the date of the highest flood in his logbook he also misses the poetical incident of the birds and the broken off olive leaf, but this was inevitable. For not even Jewish credulity could suppose that any vegetation would be left after the whole earth had been a twelve month under water. According to Onkelos, the ark rested on the mountains of Kardu, according to the Samaritan version. al Tabara, Sarnidib, upon the mountains Sarnidib. The covenant with Noah and his sons is made voluntarily by Elohim, and the setting of the bow in the cloud recalls the approach of the goddess Ishtar, who rears aloft the great bow which Anne had created in the cuneiform account. When the Semites, 
The Kashdim of scripture first came into contact with the civilized Akkadians. They were a nomad race, living in tents and quite uncivilized. They borrowed the rudiments of their civilization and mythology from Akkad, and even the words in which these were expressed. M. Burnouf says that the myths that they have adopted, such as the deluge, the creation, the Garden of Eden, and the fall of man, have been taken by them from nations which preceded them in civilization, and which appear to be connected, at least in part, with Aryan mythology. Only they have converted myths into history. Josephus holds Thalassar, the Arapacitus of Ptolemy, to have been the native land of the Kazdim or Chaldeans. Arapacitus is a mountain canton of South Armenia, situated between Lake Vau and Lake Urumaya. At an elevation of more than 6,000 feet, at the source of the Great Zab, which flows through it. It is from this district that the Semitic tribe, or a portion of it, which afterwards became known as the Hebrews, or men from beyond the Euphrates, is supposed to have emigrated. And after settling at Ur on the lower Euphrates, a portion of the emigrants appear to have ascended the Euphrates to Haran, whence the Abrahamites wandered to the desert, bordering on Canaan. The Semites are unknown to history till a period between 3000 and 2000 BC, when they gradually conquered the primitive and highly civilized populations of Babylonia. In the following pages, M. Lenormand's notes to the first part are distinguished by the letter L. In the second and third parts, the notes are all by him. The Book of Genesis, the Masoretic Text in its Present State.